It really is a very special pleasure to join you at this 2019 annual education conference. Um, I think that the theme is a very appropriate one, but it comes at a time when our nation is confronted with uh, crucial choices that have to be made as we plot our path to what is possibly the most significant two or three decades in our national history. In a few years, in a few decades, two decades in fact we are told, we will possibly be the third most populous country in the world. We will also have one of the youngest populations in the world and we stand a chance of becoming the undisputed most developed African nation on earth or perhaps one of the most advanced economies in the world. We are in that fortunate position because of our natural endowments, the incredible possibilities also that technology and innovation offer to redefine our economy for growth and the real opportunities that we have to leapfrog over generations just on account of technology in this whole development story. But most importantly, the potential of our people the potential of the Nigerian person, children today, and so many who are coming behind. But we're also confronted by fundamental challenges. A large population of out-of-school children, and we've heard so much said about that already, and a huge percentage of that number who are girls. And of course we know that the female population is about 50% of our total population. Some even say much more, more than 50%. And then there is a dearth of teachers, complicated by poor quality of teachers. In addition, years of neglect of education at both federal and state levels, resulting in very poor infrastructure. Very little has been invested. And when you look at the overall picture, very little has been invested. The other challenge is that of extreme poverty and its innumerable consequences for health, for well-being, for the majority of Nigerians and the resulting vicious cycle of low productivity, poor human development outcomes and increasing poverty. The challenges of poverty and poor educational outcomes are directly connected. And so uh, there is a UNESCO uh, uh, monitoring report which details, I, and, and I, think it's an, I think it's an interesting report, it details that connection and provides some important evidence on the impact of education on the individual's earnings and even on economic growth. Amongst other things that the report finds, it says that education reduces poverty and that poverty, absolute poverty, could be reduced by as much as 30% from learning improvements alone. But by just improving learning, uh, by just improving uh, all of our learning methods and all of that, we could actually reduce poverty by as much as 30%. It says also that education increases individual earnings as it increases earnings by roughly 10%. I wonder what to do about this technological wonder. <laughs> And it says that, it, uh, that actually that by just uh, increasing, that you could actually increase earnings by about 10% for each additional year of schooling. Indeed, for, uh, it says also that for one dollar that is invested uh, uh, in an additional year of schooling, earnings increase by as much as five dollars in low-income countries and $2.5 in lower to middle income countries. It says education reduces inequalities. It found that workers from poor and rich backgrounds, if they receive the same education, the disparity between the two in terms of, uh, in, in terms of just uh, poverty, in terms of their inequality in earnings, is decreased by as much as almost 40%. It says that education promotes economic growth as educational attainment explained about half of the difference in growth between Asia and sub-Saharan African countries. So there is no question at all that there is a direct link between education and 
the extreme poverty that we find ourselves in. So responding to this twin challenge, Mr. President, uh, President Muhammad Buhari, made two crucial commitments within the same month. On June 12th, 2019, he declared that the crucial objective of our administration in this second term is to take 100 million Nigerians out of poverty within the next 10 years. And on June 20th, 2019, while inaugurating the National Economic Council, he also made another commitment, which is that the federal government will work with the states to ensure the enforcement of free and compulsory education in the first nine years of a child's school life. He also went on to say that because this is a law, by the way, is a law that has a penalty, it's actually imprisonment for not obeying that law. He says that anybody who does not ensure the enforcement, and this, I, I say this to the states and the commissioners and permanent secretaries who are present here, he says that it's a criminal offense, not, and it is indeed a criminal offense because that's what the law says, not to ensure the enforcement of free and compulsory education. So, <clears throat> if you need a lawyer, I'm available. <laughs> So to, so to resolve the educational challenge is to resolve the poverty challenge. If we're able to resolve the educational challenge, we will also resolve to a very large extent the poverty challenge. The choices that lie before us are very clear. Investing in relevant education, by that I mean education that would equip the child with the best possible skills. Today, digital skills, civic skills, innovative skills, Education that equips to function optimally in a world that is increasingly being defined by the developments and what uh, is called the fourth industrial revolution. The policy responses that uh, are led by the Federal Ministry of Education, in my view, have been thoughtful and robust. And the Education for Change Strategy 2018 to 2022, a lot of, what, of which we've heard already from the Honorable Minister, I believe deserve commendation. Through this approach, deliberate steps have commenced to action certain priority areas. And I'll just mention a few of them. The first is out of school, the out of school children, the problem of out of school children. The second is youth and adult literacy. The third is science, technology, engineering, and maths. Now we add A to it, we add arts to it. So ours is not STEM, it is STEAM. And then there's technical vocational education, uh, TVET. There's basic education, teacher education, capacity building and professional development. And then there's curriculum and policy matters, which are also being looked at. Tertiary education, education data and planning, information and communication technology, ICT, in education. And then library services in education as well. We must immediately acknowledge, though, that the federal government's constitutional role, and I emphasize constitutional role, in the first nine years of a child's life is minimal. It is primarily the role and responsibility of the states and local governments. States simply have to prioritize basic education by making more funding available. Everyone, every child, must have basic education, at the very least. It is about the future of the citizens of every state. However, the, the role of the federal government, and the federal government considers that it has a crucial role to play, especially in guiding, in inspiring, in coordinating, and also co-funding and complementing the basic education strategy. The federal government cannot run away from its role in co-funding and also in, 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 in coordinating and generally giving direction as to uh, the basic education uh, strategy. And this must be so, as is important for us, because the whole question of human capital development is the responsibility of the central government anyway. And how, whatever those outcomes look like, we are the ones who take the blame. So today, if somebody says there are 10.3 million children out of school and some give us a higher figure, people don't even remember that it's the responsibility of the states as far as they are concerned. What is Buhari up to? Why can't you solve that problem? Yeah, you know. We must continue to find creative ways of dealing with the huge problem of out-of-school children. 
We've seen an almost 40% rise in school enrollment in schools across the 33 states, where the federal government, 34 states now, where the federal government has uh, the homegrown school feeding program going on. But of course, you know, that kind of situation has also led to overcrowding in, some, in, in many of the classrooms, which creates another set of problems uh, with regard to school infrastructure and the ability of children to learn uh, in such conditions. Some of the latest figures show that we have 22.4 million children in about 406,000 classrooms in public primary schools in Nigeria. Uh, this is about 55 children in a class, which almost uh, doubles the accepted, I believe it's 30 children per class or so. So this means that we, we just have to find the resources to build additional classrooms across the country so that children can learn in optimal conditions. It's evident that even with the best efforts, given the resources that we have, and the population growth, which is just slightly under 3% annually, we just have to think out of the box, especially using technology and digital means to reach a growing number of children. This is also placed, it will also mean a huge demand at the national level of ensuring wider broadband coverage, for example, and also at the school level in terms of availability of uh, computers and you know, the kind of electronic equipment that could help. Although these days, I mean, even mobile technology is really helping a great deal. So without necessarily using you know, broadband as such, there is a great deal that can be done using USSD, method, using USSD systems. Our national fiber coverage for now is extremely low. I think we're just under 45% or so. And that's, you know, uh, 40, so 45% of the population within five kilometers proximity is within five kilometers proximity to a fiber network, which means over 100 million people are outside the reach of any kind of Wi-Fi or any kind of fiber. At the more granular level, only 3,600 public schools, pr public primary schools, out of the 63-odd thousand have any kind of access to computers or electronic equipment. The ratio, we are told, is a bit better in, pub in junior uh, secondary schools, public junior secondary schools, where just over one-third have access to computers. Fortunately, we already have arrangements to support state governments in this area through funds made available to UBEC as a first-line charge in the budget. So the budgeted amount for 2019 was a, uh, something in the order of about 112 uh, billion. And we've heard already, the only minister was telling us uh, how we're now working with the states, and I put that very delicately, to enable them to access UBEC funds so as to build schools and equip them appropriately. So improving access and uh, the amount of funding by reviewing the process and conditionalities for accessing uh, UBEC intervention funds by states, with the aim of increasing accountability, we hope will generate uh, more impact in the near term. Of course, you've heard how we've had to do that by deducting uh, practically forcibly from the Paris Club reforms to ensure that states were able to pay uh, their counterpart funding. But I think that is an effective way of ensuring that uh, counterpart funding is uh, accessed. Some of the states of the Federation have shown uh, full or near full access to uh, UBEC intervention funds. And a lot of progress has been made. Several have made progress, especially in infrastructure, teacher development, and teaching materials. But with respect to digital infrastructure, a major priority of the federal government is to achieve 100% broadband coverage by 2023. That's a major pillar of our second term agenda, and we, and we hope that we will be able to do so. Now, we found, for instance, in implementing our NPOWER program, and for those who do not uh, know what the NPOWER program is, this is the uh, huge program that the federal government has as one of the social investment programs where we've engaged about 500,000 young men and women, graduates, uh, into this scheme. Many of them are teachers in local governments and some uh, extension workers in farms. Now, in implementing that program, we're able to see that we could actually deploy instructional material and training 
could actually be made available to volunteers of the scheme via their electronic tablets. Each, well, at least about half of them now, have a tablet such as I have, an electronic tablet such as I, such as I have. And that tablet has a lot of instructional material. Uh, a lot of them who are teachers have quite a bit of material. And of course, there are also other materials on entrepreneurial uh, training and all sorts of other useful material that they could use. But in addition to that, we have an open portal where they could literally log on to and get a lot of material. So we found that th this was an effective way of actually preparing uh, these beneficiaries wherever they are across uh, uh, the country. And it helped a great deal. Of course, there are constraints where you don't have, uh, where, where you don't have access to uh, the internet. But what we're able to do is that we're able to load a lot of that material into, uh, the, in, into their tablets. And then wherever they're able to access uh, the internet, they actually can download a lot of material also from the open portals. So we think that this might be a way of being able to train on scale, or at least supply additional material after face-to-face -face training has taken place on the kind of scale that will be needed to do uh, the kind of work that we need to do for uh, the size of our population, the number of teachers that we need. So getting children to school and ensuring that they are instructed in the appropriate surroundings with the right equipment is just one part of the equation. We also have to ensure that they stay in school and that they are provided with suitable instruction while there. So while the completion rate for primary schooling is about 86%, that of junior secondary schools is, is in the order of about 42%. In fact, there is a great gender imbalance, as we already know, at this level, with female completion rates at just 34%. So to keep children in school for the entire period of basic education, in addition to providing free public education and enforcing mandatory attendance, there are all sorts of ideas that have been proposed. Well, one of the ideas, again, just tying this to what we're doing with the Empire program is that evidence of completion of the first three years of secondary school is now required for participation in the Empire non-graduate apprenticeship schemes, such as Empire Build. This is you know, an apprenticeship scheme that allows people who do not have uh, secondary education to learn uh, a skill, such as carpentry, plumbing, masonry, uh, electrical uh, skill, uh, being an elect electrician, welding, you know, bakery, you know, and all of that. Now, all of these skills, we will insist that you must at least have some, you know, the first three years of education. Otherwise, you, you will not be qualified to do so. But this, again, is helpful only to the extent that um, people see the, the development of these skills as essential. It certainly isn't the solution to keeping uh, young people in school for the period that they should. So all the other initiatives are, are important or possibly even more important, in, more important. Evidence from around the world and even domestically has shown that the quality of educational outcomes is possibly more dependent on the quality of teachers or the quality of teaching. So some of the best practices that we've drawn from showed that students placed with high-performing teachers performed several times, in some cases three times better than those with low-performing teachers. And I'll not repeat uh, the detailed work plan that uh, the Honourable Minister has already uh, set out. But I must add that we intend to diligently adopt continuous professional development for teachers, linking it to new opportunities, linking teacher training to revised, uh, the revised curriculum using a scripted approach, as well as introducing learning assessments and performance management. And we believe that this will provide motivation for low-skilled teachers and a clearer process for remedial action to improve performance. The truth of the matter is that, and the, the Honourable Minister and I were speaking a, a moment ago, that it's not mm -hmm. enough to say that we are interested or that we have a STEM or STEAM curriculum if we don't have the teachers that are trained to teach that curriculum. 
So we absolutely must find, we absolutely must find a way of training teachers with the competence that is required for them to implement that curriculum. Otherwise, the curriculum is not even worth the paper that is written on. Improving teacher support through mentoring is also important. In addition to that, uh, to improving teacher capacity, we'll also be providing support by building an ecosystem that supports learning by teachers. This requires engaging schools through the various ministries of education, as well as school headmasters. The intention is to give teachers a new experience as to how they learn and how they learn to teach. And the training will be to enable teachers to take a multidisciplinary approach to teaching and helping to solve real life problems. We believe that this experience will be complemented and should be complemented with not just uh, teaching aids and materials, but a much greater use of technology. So, just as I've said, the policy is to use uh, science, engineering, arts and maths, a curriculum, this curriculum in primary and secondary schools. And the emphasis being on developing skills in cross-disciplinary, uh, critical and creative thinking, problem solving, digital technologies, which, are, which we all believe are essential to the 21st century, to any of the 21st century occupations that, that are emerging today. And so I, I think that what, where, where we are today is in, in, in many senses, you know, a, a very critical place. And I must thank very much the, uh, our international funders the, and international partners for the excellent work that they are doing. I mean, just looking at what is going on, uh, just looking at what is going on in Bauchi and Sokoto is incredible. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, tra the, the work that's also been done in several northern states, I believe it's called the BESTA training, which is also excellent. I was in KB State uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was actually shown some of what was going on as part of that training and some of the equipment that's been supplied. So I really want to thank and commend our international partners for the very great work they're doing. As they say, you know, it takes a whole village to train a child, and I think this global village in helping to train the Nigerian child is greatly appreciated indeed. Thank you very much. But I must say, but I must say that for us, and when I mean us, I mean uh, the federal government, state governments, Nigerian civil society groups, the Nigerian private sector, we must take ownership of this most important feature of our lives. This, this, this for us is existential. The education of our children is existential for us. As we've shown, there is a, there is a, there is a, uh, a, a, a logical link between education and poverty. And of course, we know that extreme poverty and death and mortalities that we've seen is also connected without any doubt at all. So it's up to us, really. You know, every country, in my view, and when I say every country, it's not just the government, the civil society, the private sector, every one of us must feel that we are, uh, that, that we are mandated by, by, by history, mandated to do something concrete about the education of our children. We can't leave it to uh, government. We can't leave it to uh, the state government or uh, all of that. Every one of us has a, has a role to play. And I really uh, hope that in the next uh, few years, and um, by the time we come back for another education uh, conference, that we're seeing greater participation of Nigerian civil society and the Nigerian uh, private sector in the education, in the educational sector, especially funding. You know, uh, and I must again commend Oando, they are doing excellent work. But we need to see much more private sector uh, involvement, especially the Nigerian private sector. So I'd like to thank you very much uh, for uh, listening to me. And also to say that we and the federal government remain very, very committed to ensuring that uh, education is given priority in practically everything we do. We may not have that much money, but um, we have the heart and we are really committed. Thank you very much. Thank you.